I'm super excited to continue the conversation about Ancestry DNA cousin matches and what your next steps might be in your family history research. In this episode, we're going to be using a real life example of a brick wall and well, it's my family and uh, my missing great grandfather when we come back. Before we get started with the DNA cousin matches, uh, let me introduce myself if this is your first time here. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster with, and factually with your family research. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. There is a newsletter, a Facebook page, and a website. Links for all of that are in the description box below. And hey, I wanna give a shout out uh, to a fellow YouTuber. Uh, she is a health advocate and clinical nutritionist and registered dietitian. Her name is Lindy Ford. Lindy's entire purpose is to inspire you to live a greater freedom. Her channel is full of, of researched and up-to-date nutritional information and advice to help improve your life. She is really inspiring. Links to her channel are in the show notes below, or you can just search Lindy Ford Nutrition and Wellness in the YouTube search box. All right, so back to this video. Uh, the video, this subject has a uh, handout for it for the information access level channel members. I'll upload that to the channel members uh, only blog post here in the community tab on the YouTube channel here. Uh, now, if you are not a channel member and you wanna join, uh, you can click the join button right below this video on the YouTube channel and learn all about it, okay? So this episode is using a real tree and real DNA cousin matches, mine. And well, I'm gonna show you how traditional genealogical research in combination with DNA cousin matches work to solve a huge brick wall in my family history. This all revolves around uh, strategies that anyone can use. And so by using this real example, it'll help you understand how you can do this. And so, well, I'm using real names as well with permission of those people and I thank them in advance. All right, so let's jump over to the computer and learn a little bit more about it. Okay, as a reminder from last time, we were working on DNA cousin matches. So we're gonna jump over there. In the previous episode, I had discussed how to determine who your cousins are and what lines they belong to and then mark them with these uh, color coding systems so that we could then determine which line they belong to. So we're going to pick up where that left off right now. But first I want to explain uh, what the problem is, what the research question is. And uh, right here is my great grandfather. Okay. And uh, we've talked about him several episodes in the past and I'm going to use the DNA cousin matches uh, to help super sleuth uh, the problem I have here. Henry Gus is his name. It was, he was known as Gus, Gustav. Uh, his mother was Rebecca Henley, okay? And he did not know who his father was. His father is missing. The family lore is, as it was told to me by a woman who wrote a book called The Saga, and it has a lot to do with the uh, Lassiters and Henleys in North Carolina. She wrote this book and she, before she died, she gave me a couple copies of the book and she said, look, um, I interviewed one of the grandchildren of Rebecca. Rebecca did not disclose who the fathers were, father or many fathers, not sure, uh, who they were because she loved having children, but she didn't like so much to have the men around. So, uh, the granddaughter of Rebecca had told uh, the author of this book, uh, Eleanor Bell, she said that she, as a child, used to sit under the table. Rebecca was a seamstress. She used to sit under the table while Rebecca was sewing and listen to the women tell stories. And she said that she didn't think that her grandmother was actually realizing that that she was listening, 
but that Rebecca said that she would never disclose who the pa- the fathers of her children were, that they were prominent men in the community, and uh, that she would never say who they were. Okay, so now we've got a little backstory about about Rebecca. Okay, so the research question is, who is Henry Gus Henley's father? And so we're going to use both traditional genealogy coupled together with genetic genealogy to at least get us closer to our answer. So stay tuned. I'm going to walk you through every step of this process. All right, let's start with what we know with regard to Rebecca and her children. So scrolling down here and taking a look at all of her children, she had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight children. And so, of course, the one with the big blue heart here is my great-grandfather. He's the one that we're focused on. So we have eight children all out of wedlock. So one of the first things I did besides taking a DNA test myself was I contacted one of the eldest uh, male family members who is a grandson of Henry Gustav Henley, and I asked him to take a Y DNA test. And, of course, I paid for it, and I... Uh, sent it off and the results came back. Well, before I really get into the results of the Y DNA test, let me quickly explain why I did a Y DNA test. Uh, this is me down here, and this is my father, my grandfather, and my great grandfather. And just as a reminder, if you're not familiar with Y DNA, uh, a male hands down a hundred percent of the Y DNA from father to son. So a a, a male has the exact same Y DNA as his father, as his grandfather, as his great grandfather, and so on. So if we, in this scenario, a Y DNA test was perfect. Uh, my father's first cousin took the Y DNA test since my father had passed away. And, and he has the exact same Y DNA as my father, right? So by having that Y DNA, I could, you know, then determine, uh, some clues about who this mystery man is. So why DNA test can only be taken at family tree DNA and so here are the results from that test and as you can see all four of the matches for my cousin and the grandson of of Gus is the, the surname Davis which is very strong evidence and you know one of the big steps that you're now taking in this next level is to research the trees of cousin matches. Now here at Family Tree DNA he had four matches. All four have the surname of Davis and if you look right here there are these little tree icons and digging into their trees I'm not going to bother you with with all the details but digging into those trees they were really no help. They do have the earliest known ancestors listed here and these earliest known ancestors do not have a connection that I have found as of yet. Okay, so now we have some very strong evidence that Gustav, Henry Gustav Henley's father, his surname is Davis. Okay, so now let's take a look at the cousin matches on Ancestry.com. These are cousin matches to me, and as you may recall, if you saw the previous episode, I'll leave a flag in the top of the screen for you now about that. That's kind of the precursor to this episode. But we talked about how to sort out your uh, ancestry DNA cousin matches, and you can do this on any of the DNA services. But to sort them out and figure out which lines each cousin match belongs to, and in here I have color coded some of these out. Now, a quick and dirty way we're looking for Davis now remember so one of the quick and dirty ways I could do this is I could search the surname for Davis the problem with Davis is it's a lot like Smith and I hit search sorting through them I can tell uh, that which cousins don't belong because I've already previously determined that these two are Booth so we're really looking for the ones that I had already determined to be on the Davis side of my family so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up to groups and I had created a uh, a group called Davis on the Henley side. This was to help me uh, determine uh, which line it was coming from. So Davis is kind of a subset of Henley here. So I'm going to hit apply. 
and I'm going to close out this Davis. And now I come up with just a few high quality matches. This is a third cousin and this is the fourth cousin bucket. Okay, so now we have determined that we have a Davis surname that we're looking for. We have filtered our cousin matches down to the Davis line that we know we have cousins in common with Davis ancestors and again I know that may sound confusing you really need to watch the other episode if you haven't if you if you're lost at this point but so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in and we're gonna take a look at the trees of our cousin matches now I wanna thank Sharon for allowing me to use her her tree here and if we scroll down and we take a look at the Davises here is Joel Davis Lorana Edith Davis okay so now we're starting to pay attention to who is where all right so now I want to look at the next closest cousin and this is Rob Powers thank you Rob for letting me use your family tree as well and if we uh, scroll down here and look at his tree look at here Joel Davis Lorana Edith Davis now does that mean Joel Davis is the father of my great-grandfather Definitely not. We need to do some more research. What this does tell me is that Joel Davis, turns out to be Joel Davis Jr., uh, has Sharon Atkinson, which we talked about. She's at 116 centimorgans, and Rob Powers is at 72 centimorgans. Um, both of them are descending from Joel Davis through Lu Luana Davis and on down okay so these guys are cousins of each other as well okay so now is when we start doing some more traditional genealogy research we've discovered that there is a Joel Davis in Randolph County North Carolina who is showing up in two different trees and and the reality is he shows up in several trees I'm just not going through all of that with you but if we scroll down here and I start doing some research on this family, this is the guy I started with. I started doing some research on Joel Davis Jr. Turns out that he has a whole lot of siblings and I've marked all the men with this kind of a warning symbol because I'm playing with different scenarios. So I wanted them to jump out at anybody who happens to be looking at my tree to realize, wait a minute, there's a warning here. These are just hypotheses. And so it turns out that their father's name is Joel Davis as well. Well, this Joel Davis also shows up in the top, top two uh, family trees. And so we know that from a genetic standpoint, this Joel Davis is in the family tree. But we don't know which one of these five brothers is the father of my great-grandfather and by the way you can create a floating tree I had this uh, Joel Davis and family are they are not attached to anybody in my tree but there's a quick and easy way to do that you can just attach like in this case Joel Davis to anybody in your tree it really doesn't matter and then once you're in there you go in and you disconnect them with the tool icon in the upper right corner and that puts them in their own floating space in the tree and really quickly how you would do that is while you're in any of the profiles you would just go up to edit edit relationships and then X out whatever relationship that you had attached them to and that way uh, when you're done they'll be floating in their own tree and so when you go back to view them in the tree they're not attached to anybody and then how you go about getting back to them is you search for uh, their name in the search box and you can find them floating around in your tree otherwise you're not going to find them okay so I do more research right I go to the Randolph County Library and I discover that there are some bastardy bonds listed there and these are for Rebecca and uh, what I've done here is I listed the bastardy bonds that I found on one side and all of her children on the other side so if you're not familiar with what bastardy bonds are Bastardy bonds are a way f back in the day when uh, a woman got pregnant out of wedlock and sh the courts did not want to have to be responsible for the maintenance of these children and the expense that goes along with it. So what they would do 
Well, there was actually a law. And so what they would do is it would drag the woman into court, make her tell who the father of these children were. Well, if she refused to do so, somebody had to put up money as a bond to uh, say that they were going to care for these children. And so in this case, Joshua Davis in 1858 put up a bond for a child that it, I don't see in the list of children that I have discovered so far. So it could be that the, the baby was miscarried or for, for whatever reason um, or died after childbirth or whatever, but there's no child here. But Joshua Davis is listed as bondsman. Well, a lot of times when they don't want to admit that they are the father of a child, they will be put up the bond anyway. And so um, sometimes that was the case with whether they were fathers or they were just friends who were helping out, but we don't know for sure. But being that we have a genetic connection to this, this family, um, we know that these boys, these men here are uh, Exum Davis and Joshua Davis are also showing up as bondsmen. And unfortunately, I don't have a bond uh, that I have found as of yet for my grandfather, great grandfather, excuse me, uh, Gus Henley, who was born in 1862. So that means she was pregnant in 1861, which means she would have shown up in court somewhere in 1861. And you got to remember also this was, you know, Civil War era. So who knows what was going on um, during this time. But of all the children listed, I found these bonds um, so far. Now, there's more work to be done. But this is proof to me that this is the right Davis family because these men are showing up as bonds, bondsmen. I've got the right group of people in Randolph County associating with Rebecca, you know, definitely part of the um, fan club. And so we move on. Also keep in mind that through our genetic connection, we discovered this, this Davis family and Joshua and Exum Davis, who are brothers, are also the same guys that are in those bonds. Okay, well, all this information is all too exciting. So let's play here for a moment. What if we were to take, and what I've done here is I've got two of uh, two windows open side by side so you could see them side by side. So here's Henry, Gus Henley, missing father, and here's Joel Davis family with the boys uh, marked out so we can see them easily. What if we were to play with through lines by plugging in the boys, the men, I keep wanting to call them boys, the men. Uh, what if we plug in these guys into this father hole as an experiment to see what happens? Now there are some lessons to be learned here. That's why I want you to stick around and watch this because um, there are some really valuable lessons about through lines and what it can and cannot do. Um, so, so bear with me. So now what I want to do is I want to plug in one of the, of the brothers. And I'm going to start with Exum Davis because, uh, A, he's the youngest. And what I hadn't shown you was Exum Davis is only about three years apart uh, in age from Rebecca. So he's one of the more likely suspects. So I'm clicked on, you know, to add a new father there. And instead of typing his name, I don't want to duplicate his name. I'm going to pick him from the tree because remember, he's in the floating tree. And as I start to type his name, he pops up. And now I have him in the tree as a suspect. And this is another great way uh, by using these little emojis in the suffix field. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If we go down to name and gender, if you haven't seen this trick, you can put little emojis in here. That's where the heart came from. This is where I just went and did Emojipedia and I searched for a warning symbol. And uh, I, I really like that one for this situation because it's a hypothesis. And part of the problem is when you're viewing the tree, um, sometimes these emojis, if the name's really long, they don't show up. As you know, you can put these my tree tags in here and mark them as a hypothesis or brick wall or whatever, um, but they don't show up in the tree view. But the little symbols a lot of times will if the name is not super long. 
Okay, so now we've got Exum Davis in here as a hypothesis. Let's go take a look at through lines now. And I'm over here in through lines and I'm going to scroll down. There's my great grandfather that we're working on, but we actually want to go up one more generation to look at the through lines to see how it works. And here's Exum Davis now. And so I click on him. Now the problem with the through lines in this situation with Exum Davis being up here, there's uh, Gus Henley and my grandfather, my father, my aunt. And the problem is all of the cousin matches are people I know. And so that doesn't help me because they all funnel through my grandfather. So we'd actually need to go up one more generation. Okay, so back to the tree. So now here's Exum. Here's Joel Davis, his father. If we click on the through lines icon for Joel Davis, this is Joel Davis Sr. as as opposed to the brother of Exum Davis, who was Joel Davis Jr. We're looking at Joel Davis Sr. So let's go look at him. And we look at the through lines. We view the through lines. And now we have 14 DNA matches. The problem here again is that they are all from the siblings. They're all descending through the siblings of Gus Henley and still funneling through Exum Davis. So we still aren't getting any definitive information about which one of these brothers it could be because We've got Exum Davis plugged in here. And I promise you that if I go and I plug in all the other brothers, I'm going to get the same results. I'm going to get the same DNA cousin matches popping up across the different descendants. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to disconnect Exum Davis from Hen Henry Gus Davis by going in here. I'm going to go to his profile. I'm going to edit. I'm going to edit the relationships. And I am going to remove Rebecca as a spouse. I'm going to remove it. What it did was associate all the children. So I'm going to remove all of the children. And now I've removed Exum Davis from the list. So now if we go back and view in the tree, this is going to be Exum Davis. And he's floating out here by himself. If I go back to the home person, which is me. And now we have disconnected Exum Davis from Henry Gus David, uh, Henley. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one of the other brothers to the tree. As a reminder, there were five brothers and they're represented in here. Here's Joel Davis Sr. And the five men that uh, are potential fathers of... Gus Henley. So we had plugged in Exum Davis before. Now we're going to plug in Joshua Davis. So we're going to look for him in the tree because he's already in a floating tree. And now sometimes you may have to wait for the results to change on the through lines. Now Joshua has the same father, Joel Davis, but you notice the through lines button's not showing just yet. It may take some time for the algorithms to work. Let's go see if we can find it over here and see if it's showing up over here yet. All right, so now Joshua Davis is showing up over here instead of Exum Davis. And again, I'm getting the same cousin matches now funneling through Joshua Davis instead of, instead of Exum Davis. Okay, so my point here is that be careful with through lines because no matter what you plug in, keep in mind that through lines is built on the trees of other people. And in my case, I changed my tree and it, uh, you know, gave me different results. So through lines is only as good as the tree it is built on in collection with the other DNA evidence. So because my true, my tree is not accurate, the through lines is going to be inaccurate. Okay. Okay. So here's the deal. In order for us to really use DNA to help solve this problem, we need to research the descendants of all of the five brothers. So here's Joel Davis right here. And here's one, two, three, four, five brothers that we suspect one of them, we know one of them has to be the father of my great grandfather, Gus Henley. Okay. So what we need to do is research 
all of the descendants of these five brothers, at least, if not the entire family, and look for uh, DNA matches. And then, in theory, the DNA matches that are the highest should point us to the direct line to Joel Davis, if that makes sense. So let's pretend for a minute that the descendants here, I know that there are DNA matches down here under Lorana Edith Davis. So if the true line funnels through her, then Joel Davis is the father if the DNA results are stronger under her as opposed to maybe Makaija's descendants or as opposed to Exum's descendants. But the reality is there it's a little more complicated than that. Let's look at it this way. Here's my tree, my known tree right here, okay? We know that, um, you know, there I am, my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, Henry Gus Henley, okay? Now, we know also that because of the DNA cousin matches that we've gotten and we examined their trees, that we know that one of these guys is definitely my great great grandfather okay now in order to really determine what kind of cousin matches we need to be looking at <clears throat> to find the answer to this problem we need to be looking at in a perfect world in a normal marital situation we would be looking at a third a third cousin because my uh, great grand, my here. Let me look at it this way. I remember the G rule. So we're counting the G's. One, two, three. So that means it's a third cousin in a perfect world. But it is not a perfect world because um, my uh, great grandmother is not the mother of all of the of all of these other children. Right. I mean. So the ch children of these uh, men, Rebecca, my great-great-grandmother, is not the mother of their children. She's only the mother of Henry. Okay? So that makes the genetic situation a little different because we're now dealing with half-third cousins, which changes the expected DNA range. If we jump over to DNA Painter and we take a look at half third cousins and we find out what the expected range is, a half third cousin is 0 to 168 centimorgans with an average of 48 centimorgans. Now keep in mind that if we have a generational difference from me to one of the cousin matches, for example, they're one uh, generation closer or one generation farther apart, we might have a situation where we are half third cousins once removed. So now let's go take a look at the DNA. Of the eight children that Rebecca had here, five of them have descendants who have tested DNA, at least that I have found so far. And the centimorgan that I'm finding is rather small, which might make sense actually when you look at the fact that Henry is probably actually a half sibling to his other siblings, because it could be very likely that these other children have different fathers. So the reality is we need to go up a generation and we need to plug in a, uh, what I did was just plug in an unknown Davis instead of plugging in one of the brothers specifically, uh, and take a look at uh, a higher generation. So I created another tree here going up to Joel Davis Sr. and taking a look at the DNA relationships that we have there. And along the way, we have actually stronger, genera stronger DNA uh, in three of the lines anyhow going all the way up to Jesse Davis, who's really kind of going up the tree, but we have stronger, stronger DNA 
coming from Joel Davis. Now we have here, here's Sharon Atkinson. We talked about her before. She's at 116 centimorgans. She's the strongest DNA match I have. Her cousin, my cousin, <laughs> Rob Powers is at 72. And we've got Louise over here at 45. Now, my hypothesis is if this one here, if Joel Davis is the father, then uh, Sharon and Rob would be half second cousins, expected range to be 10 to 325 centimorgans with an average of 120 centimorgans. Well, that fits. It fits for both of them. If they are uh, the expected DNA range to me, okay? But over here with this, this is coming down the, the Exum line here. Louise at 45 centimorgans, the expected range. If Exum Davis is the great, great grandfather, then uh, the expected range would be a half second cousin once removed from Louise because she's generational difference to me. And uh, that expected range would be 0 to 190 centimorgans with an average of 66 centimorgans. She fits within that range too. So we're still not any closer because part of the problem is the centimorgan range is wide enough. Let's see if I can get them both on the screen here. The centimorgan range is wide enough that they overlap. So in theory, either one is possible. I have not found any descendants from these other three guys. Now remember that Joshua and Exum were named as bondsmen. Exum is the closest in age to Rebecca. But Joel Davis, coming through this line and these two DNA cousin matches, actually have higher centimorgan matches than any of them. So does that mean Joel Davis is the great-great-grandfather and the father of Henry Gus Henley? Let's think about that for a minute. And let me explain why that might not be true. While it certainly looks like it, it may not be true. One of the things that we need to do whenever we have a hypothesis that we're trying to prove or disprove is we need to work as hard at disproving it as we are proving it. In my opinion, there are several things that are not complete here. I don't have any DNA from some of these brothers and I need to have uh, descendant DNA to really help determine it. Additionally, we need to really research these trees. We need to research the trees of all of the family, all the way through very thoroughly, and uh, take a look and see if there are any unusual uh, behaviors within the tree, such as cousins marrying cousins. Because if that is the case, then that can make the DNA be unusually high. So if for some reason in this line there are cousins marrying cousins, then these DNA uh, results would be half again, or could be, depending on where they are in the line, could be half again higher than they should be. Because, for example, if we determine that there are some cousins marrying cousins within this family, then this 116 centimorgans might actually, if it were not a cousin relationship, marrying into a cousin relationship, then it could be somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 centimorgans, which kind of was the first thing I noticed when I saw this 116 because Rob is at 72. And it doesn't mean they're out of range. When you look at the range, the range is quite broad. And so it doesn't mean that that's not the case. But let me show you one more thing. Remember Sharon Atkinson, she is uh, one, the 116 centimorgan uh, cousin match that I have and she has a beautiful tree. Uh, I have been digging around in her tree for a while and when we were talking about cousins marrying cousins, let's take a look at this. We've got Joel Davis down here and this is the same tree that we have been uh, researching and she's got it quite filled out quite nicely. Uh, thank you Sharon for helping <laughs> me do my research. But look up here, we have a James Davis as well. Now, in looking at his 
uh, tree. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the same people. I've been kind of looking around here and it might be, again, it might be one of those situations where it's like a Smith, where there's just a Davis and two entirely different lines. Uh, but the fact that there's James Davis and a Joel Davis and James is very popular in this Joel Davis family, um, just because I haven't found it doesn't mean that it, that they aren't related. Here's a James Davis up here. It could be this James Davis somehow ties into this James Davis. Who knows? But my point is, I'm not ready to put this to bed yet. I'm not ready to say which one of these brothers is the father of my great grandfather, Henry Gus Henley. Now it's it, to me, it's likely going to be one of these three guys. But in order to really prove one way or the other, I really need to seek out the DNA of the descendants of all of these gentlemen and do some more research. Plus I need to really uh, kind of spread my wings even further in the tree and really flush out the tree. And you know, it could be that Joel Davis is the father or it could be that he went off to fight in the Civil War or was out of town or was living in Virginia or who knows what. But it could be that we can start eliminating some of these guys because of certain circumstances. You know, he's likely too old. I have not found any um, descendants of, of this guy at all so far, um, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. And so, you know, these two gentlemen were named in the uh, bastardy bonds. This guy has the highest DNA count, but when you look at, you know, the possibility of cousins marrying cousins within this line, you know, it might be that Exum's line ends up having the highest DNA uh, count to me. But when we start getting out that far, it's very hard to determine definitively this far up the line, you know, we're talking, you know, the early 1800s and, uh, you know, we start to reach the limits on what our DNA can do for us. So part of my next steps is to turn over every rock. And part of that has to do with digging into wills and land records. And here I have started to map out some of the deeds that I've been finding for both the Davis family and my uh, great-grandfather, Henry Gus Henley. Uh, his land is mapped out here and Joshua Davis is not far away. So um, I also have been reading the Quaker church records because there is a ton of information in there and both sides of the family uh, were kicked out of the church. Um, there was a lot going on with the Quakers at that time where a lot of people were leaving the church um, for uh, disputes and moral differences and a, a variety of things. But all of that traditional genealogy will help tell the story of those uh, DNA cousins that we have. Well, I made huge gains in my brick wall. And I may never find out who the father of Gus is, but I do now know who his grandparents are in Joel Davis and Pinana Newby. All right, so now I can continue my genealogical journey on the Davis and Newby lines to go farther back in time. I'm also always open to suggestions, so if you have any other places I should look, please put them in the comment sections below. I'm all ears, and quite frankly, we all learn from each other anyway, right? So I am hoping that this all made sense to you and it was not too confusing. DNA research certainly can get complicated as you can see and in this particular example it really was complicated and it was one of the reasons why I picked this example so that you can learn all of the little stumbling blocks that you can come across as you are researching it. Remember we want to disprove as much as we prove so that we really have a good understanding of our family history and we're not running down the wrong lines doing years of research only to find out later that it was wrong. So knowledge is power and DNA does not stand alone. You have to use traditional uh, genealogical techniques in combination with the DNA uh, research. Uh, but these are techniques that anybody can use. All right, well, it is time for you to go find your ancestors, hopefully using both traditional genealogical research and some DNA techniques as well. Uh, 
There are more videos on the screen for you now. Uh, and well, it's time for you to go find your ancestors. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.